All right, well, we're in our final part of the Jesus Plus Nothing series. And if you missed the others, uh, don't worry. I'm going to help you out on that. We have been in the book of Colossians. And as we've journeyed through Colossians, we've seen a number of key truths. Remember, one of the first things we saw was that you have died. And I stress this over and over again because... Indeed, it is the neglected half of the gospel. Jesus died for your sins is one half, and you died with Jesus is the other half. I would uh, guess, I would guesstimate that if you were to interview uh, believers around the world and ask them what the cross means to them, most would be very adept at expressing the idea that Jesus paid the price, that Jesus took away our sins, that Jesus shed His blood to bring us forgiveness. But the idea that we died with Jesus would seldom be expressed. Why is that? Perhaps the enemy has done a masterful job of keeping that under wraps. But also... I would say that this message is lacking because most people think their problem is their behavior. And if my problem is my behavior, then the solution is forgiveness. But if my problem is death, then the solution is new life. And you see the core issue then, we need to discover that we had two problems, not just one problem. If we had just one problem, what we were doing and our lying and our cheating and our stealing, then God would have brought us one solution, and that is forgiveness for our actions. But he brought us a second solution, a deeper resolution to our problem. Not just our behaviors being dealt with at the cross, but the very core of our being, our self, being dealt with at the cross. And as a result then, our new self is not our enemy. You can live out a duality in your Christian experience if you're not careful. We start to think of ourself as our opponent. Many Christians think in these terms when they say things like, God, come down, rain down, be with us. And we imagine that he might visit us for a temporary period of time, perhaps on a, in a Sunday morning worship service, uh, perhaps... Uh, on a special Wednesday night praise event or something. We say, rain down, fall fresh. You know, I, we hunger and thirst for you to be with us, God. Be with us. And then we imagine him to come be with us, us lowly, dirty sinners. And then perhaps he exits just before we exit the building. Only to return to a worship service seven days later and get him to visit again. In many respects, we have the dirty worm theology going quite well. We think of ourselves as an opponent to God. In many respects, we think of ourselves as an opponent to the Christian life. And we have to get rid of self and die to self and get, out, get on that altar again. And we're trying to sort of kill ourselves. And last week, we talked about how that falls short because it neglects what Jesus did. To be specific, Jesus wants you to know who you are. Jesus wants you to know that you are not an obstacle. You are a perfect fit with Him. And so we call this the discovery of the new self, the discovery of the new creation. God in the Bible calls it counting yourself alive counting yourself alive to God. That means that I wake up in the morning and I recognize what God has already done to me and I say, I, I fit with Jesus as He is, so also am I in this world. I'm united with Christ. I'm one spirit with the Lord. I'm a perfect fit for Jesus. Now, I really want us to consider those words. I'm a perfect fit with Jesus Christ. Consider that. And even as you say it or think it this morning, you know, the enemy will bring up our behaviors and he'll say, how can you say that? How can you call yourself a perfect fit with Jesus if you've done this and this and this? And he begins to point at our track record, our file drawer that he 
has on us. And he's looking at what we're doing. But you see, this is not a matter of doing. This is a matter of being. This is not a matter of doing. It's a matter of being. It doesn't spring from our actions. It springs from our birth, a new birth, a birth certificate. And so we need to recognize the new birth and count ourselves alive to God and say that we are indeed a perfect fit for Jesus Christ. We are not Jesus. We will never be Jesus. He is our life. He is our everything. He is our source. But He will not overpower us. He will not circumvent us. He includes us. And He wants us to know that we're part of it, that we're in the middle of it, that we're very much like that burning bush. The fire was in the bush, but the fire did not consume the bush. God doesn't need to get rid of you. He already did. You've died and you've been raised to newness of life. You've been raised up with Christ, hidden in God. Last week I talked about how this was a safe place for us, to be hidden in God. Are you kidding me? That's the best place on the planet, to find that safety and that security. This is real. And you know, if we, if we look at this in Colossians chapter 3 and, and 2 and 3, if we look at this and we say, well, this is a feel-good talk and this is a biblical doctrine that is nice for a Sunday morning, then we're going to miss it. I mean, you believe something about your invisible self. Everyone does. An unbeliever believes about their invisible self that, well, maybe there is none and I'm just a brain and a body. Other people might believe in New Age philosophy. Others might believe in Buddhism. Others believe in Hinduism. Others believe in Islam. But there's a craving at the core of our being to fill this void and this gap and to understand the invisible. Now that you have come to Christ, what do you believe about your invisible self? Are you more than a brain and a body? Are you more than what they can see on the operating table over at the local hospital? Certainly, you are deeper than merely a body. And so what will you believe about your invisible self? The God of the universe has called us to believe reality. This is not feel good or fantasy. This is reality that we are united with Christ, that we're fused to Him, that He has infused His life inside of us. You know, it's, it's like uh, when two things are, are put together and they, they fit perfectly. You think about oil and water. That's the opposite, right? What happens with oil and water? You try to put them together and thank God they don't fit because then we can clean up our oceans after a spill. They don't fit. But then you look at uh, the southern formula for sweet tea, for example. Now, you put tea and water together, and what happens? They fit. In fact, many have claimed that the, I'm not sure about it, but the chemical composition of what you get at the end is a new formula. There's bonding that happens there with that southern sweet tea. Well, so it is with our union with Jesus Christ. We become something we weren't before. We are born of God, born of the Spirit. When the Spirit comes into our spirit, we become one spirit with the Lord, and we are someone that we were not before. The old me taken to the cross, the new me merged so that we can enjoy a sweet tea, spirituality, something brand new from the start right at our new birth. You have put on the new self. You know, I talked about the controversy concerning this sort of statement. I mean, people are constantly saying you need to put off and put on and put off and put on. Now, that's completely true regarding our manner of life. That is completely true regarding our attitudes and our thinking and our actions. We put off old actions. We put on new actions. We put off old attitudes. We put on new attitudes. But we don't have to put off an old self. The old self is dead, buried, and gone. 
and you've already put on the new self. This is a pretty big deal, I guess, in modern day American English. You know, what can we say about all this? You don't have to change you. You're okay. You're safe. You're secure. You're liked. You're accepted. You're appreciated. You're loved. God is for you. You don't have to fix you. Too many sermons, too many teachings, too many books, too many years and decades of Christian teaching have pounded believers into the ground saying, you need to be different, you need to change. I recently heard about someone who came home from a a, a Christian retreat and she was sitting in her kitchen at the kitchen table and her parents said, so how was the retreat this weekend? She said, you know, the same old, same old, God's good, I'm bad, and everything needs to change. (laughs) Same old, same old, God's good, I'm bad, and everything needs to change. You know, recently I received a question on the radio about how can we reach young people? I mean, young people are, are fleeing from congregations around the country. Church is becoming less and less attractive to younger people. And so the question was, what can we do? And, you know, suggestions that have been offered by Christianity at large are, well, we need to have better activities. We need to have... Uh, more uh, activities that are relevant, fine and good. We need to have better music, fine and good. We need to have more video clips, fine and good. But you see, we're just putting band-aids on a message that is lacking. It is the message that needs to change. It is not bells and whistles. It is the message that needs to change. And so, how does it need to change? Well, we need to be able to communicate with that young woman. That young woman who comes home and says, God is good and I am bad and everything needs to change. She needs to know God is good and He made you good. You've got a good heart, a new heart, a kind heart, a loving heart, a compassionate heart. God changed your heart. He exchanged your life. He changed you at the core of your being so that you would be a perfect fit with Jesus. God is not disgusted with you. He is in love with you. People need to know this, young and old. They need to see that God is for them and nothing separates them from the love of God or the like of God. As Romans says, we are accepted, accepted in the beloved. Christ is your life. You know, we've tried a few times throughout this series to grasp at this and describe this the best we can. The reality is, is it's beyond words. But, you know, we look at our fusion. We look at our union. We look at our connection with Christ. And it's not merely a connection. As we'll see as we finish out this passage today, I mean, God has invited us to do everything in the name of Jesus, to be an expression of Him in everything we do, brushing your teeth and taking the kids to school and and, uh, taking a walk with your spouse or whatever it is. I mean, God has invited us so that everything can be an expression of Jesus. That's what it means that Jesus is our life. This is a big deal. It's a big deal. I spent a solid decade of my adult Christian life thinking that if I wanted to express Jesus, He was basically expressed in about 10 ways, including Bible study and church attendance and witnessing and these sort of things. And if it wasn't that list of things, then it likely wasn't an expression of Jesus. And that is so very false. Remember that the life that we're talking about is a life that Adam and Eve enjoyed. There was no Bible for Adam and Eve. There was no local church assembly for Adam and Eve. They were walking through the garden in the cool of the day, and they were enjoying God's presence, and they were alive. Later they would lose life, but for now they had life. And there was no book to read, and there were no promises to make. There were no commitments and rededications. There were no uh, people at church taking attendance. There was no quiet time to have. 
There was nothing to chart or graph or measure to determine how they were. They simply had life. And then they chose the measuring stick, and that's what's so sad. Then they chose to quantify themselves. Then they chose religion and morality and ethics. But remember, before that, they had the life of God. They had God's presence and God's power walking with them. They had, as Anne Applegate would have said, they had relationship. And they lost that. They lost that. But you see, that is what is gained through Christ. Christ is not saying, I've come so that you might have a Bible. I've come so that you might have church. No, he said, I've come so that you might have life. Now, don't get us wrong. We love the Bible. We love God's Word. We're studying it this morning. We love to gather as the body of Christ, as a church congregation. Absolutely. But this is an hour a week. Two, if you commit to a Wednesday. What are you going to do? What are you going to do the rest of your days, the rest of your hours, the rest of your life as you are engaged in very normal everyday stuff, sitting around the Thanksgiving table, wrestling with your relatives, trying to get along with everybody, trying to make peace with people, going to work and trying to survive? Where does Christ enter into that? Christ is our life. He's not a priority. He's not a church life. He's not a ministry life. Christ is our life. Most of us live average, everyday lives. That's just the reality. When you compare it, when you have people on television judge it, they would say, well, that's an average, everyday life. It's not worth filming. Well, you know what? It's worth more than filming. It has eternal value. Every ounce of our lives has eternal value because every ounce of our lives can be an expression of Jesus. Every ounce of our living can endure eternally. That's a pretty big deal. That means that we have a cloud of witnesses, not in some sort of ominous, creepy, guilty way, <laughs> but we have a cloud of witnesses, meaning all of those who've gone before us walking by faith, trusting and depending on God, we too get to do this. Many have gone before us, but nobody like you. You're the only you. You are unique. God has never done this before. This is the first time He has expressed His life in you. There's never been a you before. This is a big deal. Christ is your life. Also, we saw that identity, identity is in Christ and not in fleshly labels. Man, this needs to be heard in today's world. So much division and racism, which we talked about, and hate and labeling people. You're a Republican. You're a Democrat. You're of this race. You're of that race. You're of this nation. You're of that nation. Sound familiar? Paul was carving out an identity for himself. I am of this nation, and I'm of this tribe, and I have this bloodline, and I have this heritage, and I have this membership card in Israel. Look at me, look at me. And then in the end, he said, it's all dung, it's all garbage, it amounts to nothing, because I've found something incredible, something unshakable in Jesus Christ. I have an identity that nobody can snatch from me. And as a result... I can go out to the people that my people hated. I can go out to the Gentiles that my fellow Jews despised. And I can go out and share the love of Christ with them and really mean it. Did Paul go out there and just change his vocabulary? Did Paul go out there and just uh, change some verbiage to try to put on love in the way that he used some words? No, this is heartfelt. This is heart stuff. His heart longed for anyone and everyone to come to Christ. I make this point to say, you've got that same heart. And I'm not talking about evangelism. I'm talking about goodness. You have a good heart. And that's why we've got the go-to place. We can go to the heart to live from. Your head, some of the thoughts you think, I mean, some of the thoughts we entertain are messed up, right? 
We've got some messed up thinking, but we've got a go-to place. We've got a heart that we can trust because God lives there and God gave us a new heart in every second, every moment of the day, there is a way. God put it this way, that in every temptation, right, there's a way out. How does that way out start? It starts by trusting. Trusting Christ, where does He live? He's not up, He's in. So I begin to trust the indwelling Christ who dwells in my heart by faith. And in every temptation, there's a way out. Maybe you're stuck right now. I mean, maybe you're stuck in something and you don't know how to get out. You don't have to know what three days from now looks like, but you can know what this moment looks like. This moment is a moment of choose. It's a moment of choose Jesus, whatever that means in this. Lord Jesus Christ, I don't have the wisdom for tomorrow. I'm stuck, I'm trapped, I'm mired in something that is a conflict for me, and I want out. Well, you may not be able to see three days from now, and you don't need to worry about three days from now. Jesus is now. So don't ask how. Say, Jesus is now. And that is the way forward, to live moment by moment and say, God, give me the words Give me the strength, be my everything in this. I lay it all at your feet, and you're enough. We're dead to sin. We're not made for sin, but Christ is the power over sin. We have no power over sin apart from Jesus Christ, and we are meant to be dependent creatures. You can self-talk all you want, but without the power of Christ, there's no power over sin. You can say, I'm dead to sin, dead to sin, dead to sin all you want, but without trusting Christ, then we're not involved in that connectedness and that dependency. And He is our strength. We need to be saying more than I'm dead to sin. We need to be saying I'm alive to God. I'm connected with Christ. So this is what it means to set your mind. You know, you have that will. You do have a will and it's, it's disconnected from the emotions. What do I mean by that? It's not controlled by the emotions. Uh, learning that I could choose apart from my emotions was a pretty big deal for me, especially with some of the emotions I've struggled with over the years. I've had a health issue that, whoa, it affects my emotions. I mean, it affects my thinking and my feelings, and I could let all that rule. Have you ever been overwhelmed by emotion? It's one thing to be overwhelmed by emotion because of a circumstance. But the circumstance, it might last a month or a year. What if you, many of you do, what if you have health issues? Some of you have neck pain or back pain and it just causes you to seize up and then it affects your emotions and then somebody comes up to say something nice to you and you just blow up out of nowhere. And they're like, what? And it's because emotions can overtake us. Physical pain can lead to emotional pain and emotions can overtake us and rule over us. And all kinds of things can cause emotional turmoil. And the beauty of the way that God has created us is this, that we have a chooser. And the chooser does not have to be dominated by our emotions. We can choose apart from what we feel. And that is what the walk of faith is. It is choosing apart from what we feel. That's not being a hypocrite. Some people think that if they live different than they feel, that that's hypocrisy. But many cases, when we live against our emotions or live despite our emotions, we are declaring that we believe in something that is deeper than our feelings. Do you believe in something deeper than your feelings? Have you ever felt unsaved and yet you were saved? Have you ever felt distant from God and yet you're one with Christ? Have you ever felt unforgiven and guilty and yet you are totally forgiven and free from condemnation? How do you explain this? I can feel opposite of the truth. And so I'm called to walk by faith, not by feeling. Consider your body dead to sin. Offer it to God. Choose to forgive. Let people off the hook. No scorekeeping. You know, it's interesting. We had two calls about divorce this week. 
and both of them involved scorekeeping. Well, I've been bad, and I've been unfaithful, but you've been unfaithful more times than me, so it's three to two, and scorekeeping happens. Scorekeeping happens in marriage, and if we're not careful, we can let that scorekeeping overtake us and ruin everything. You know, uh, it's interesting because I, I would say that this is one of the biggest deals in terms of people say, I know the new covenant, now what? I know my identity in Christ, now what? I, I'm, I'm bored, show me what to do. And this is one of the biggest things that Jesus leads us into. It really is. This is one of the biggest things that the Lord Jesus Christ will lead us into. And it's an attitude of letting things go, not keeping score, choosing to reflect the same tenderness and kindness and mercy and forgiveness that the Lord has given us. If you're wondering what Christ is up to, if you have no direction in terms of what He wants to do in your life, if you're wondering what the will of God is in your life, number one would probably be love. And number two, attached right directly to that, would be to forgive. There is so much pain in this world and people are messed up and people have been hurt so deeply that it controls them. And when it controls us, it's just overwhelming. When it controls us, we're letting somebody else dictate our actions. So, you know, we have to get to that point where we say, I forgive you and I choose to do this, and you know, I don't feel ready, my emotions don't line up, I feel all kinds of stuff, I wish I felt differently, but I don't, I don't feel ready, I'm, I'm overloaded with hurt and anger, and yet I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive because I'm good. I've got that good heart, and I'm gonna live from that good heart. My stinking thinking says, don't do it, they don't deserve it, Give them another round of revenge. Don't do it. That's what my stinking thinking says. But my good heart cries out, if you do this, you are going to be so fulfilled on the other side of this. This is going to fit with who you are, and it is going to make things way better to not be obsessed and controlled by bitterness and resentment. Put on love, Paul tells us, and also we saw let, let this mind be in you, let the wisdom of Christ rule, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, let, let, let. Well, what do we see today? Just a few more verses as we finish out this passage. First, Paul is telling us that we represent something. And, you know, I'm afraid this has been hijacked. This very verse has been hijacked by legalism. It says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. I feel like this concept has been hijacked. I, I've heard a lot of teaching over the years. Well, you, you got to do, you got to do everything in, in the name of the Lord Jesus. So the pressure's on and you better live it out. And God is watching, and the angels are watching, and you live in a glass house, and the pressure's on, and be a good witness, and make sure you, and that sort of thing. You know, what I would say here is, isn't it just plain amazing that anything we do can be done in His name? I mean, just think about how this is rigged, how this is even possible, how it is that you, a regular old fella, or you, a regular old woman, a regular person, I better not say old woman, right? Be careful with that. A regular young woman and a regular old fella. I mean, here you are, just a regular person, and anything you do can be done in the name of Jesus. How is that? Is it just because you're an ambassador? Is it just because you've been sent like a missionary? Is it just because, well, you're supposed to do stuff that looks like Jesus, imitate Him? No, it's because you're indwelt. It's because you're infused. At one point, Paul tells us we can speak as if we're speaking the very words of God. What does that mean? Everything we say is inspired scripture? No, it means you're indwelt. It means you're indwelt. And there's no other representation on the planet like you. 
We are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Jesus. We are united with the Lord. There's no other expression like you. Creation is awesome. It is a testimony to the Creator. But us, as the family of God, there will never be another you. And so we can wake up every day and whatever, do you see it? Whatever you do, but Lord, my stuff, it's so plain, it's so average. I'm making four and five lunches a day, Lord. I'm driving the kids to school and they're screaming their heads off. I wish I had a larger minivan so they'd be farther back. We need a retaining wall, Lord. Everything I'm doing is so ordinary and messy. And he's saying, whatever you do, whatever it is, you can be an expression of me. Family life in Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. I want to read these two verses together so you see the balance. There's been a lot of abuse in this area without understanding the balance. The next verse says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. So as we look at these two together, you'll notice what God's doing here. I mean, God has picked the number one struggle for men and the number one struggle for women, the number one need for men, and the number one need for women. He's identified these things, and then he's showing us what is Jesus up to here. You know, men are bottomless pits for respect. I mean, I don't know why, but we, we're bottomless pits for respect. And many, many women, many wives have discovered this. And in fact, they end up bending over backwards trying to give space and give room and pay respect and allow decision making. And they're doing the dance and they feel like they're walking on eggshells to make sure the guy is propped up because we're so sensitive about respect. And then you look at the need of a wife. Husbands, love your wives. Don't be embittered against them. How many husbands have started off, I mean, they're, they're glowing about their wives and, oh, here's what's going to happen. And the 19-year-old or 24-year-old expectation is this, right? That I am just going to marry this woman and I am going to please her and she is going to have an eternal smile on her face and I'm going to make her happy. I am going to be her life I'm going to be her provider. I'm going to do it just right. And all signs are a go on this. I mean, you know, everybody's pleased in the relationship and we've all put our best foot forward or whatever. And then, you know what the husband discovers? This woman has thoughts of her own. <laughs> this woman has ideas and thoughts and feelings and maybe even an agenda, like she's got some plans. And so now, now the Lord is saying, hey, are you going to recognize that husband and esteem that? Or are you going to be threatened by that? Are you going to be embittered against that, treating it as competition and a challenge? Or are you going to recognize the value that God has put in this woman? And so we see the number one need of a woman is to be loved and cherished and recognized. And then men, bottomless pits for respect. And God has identified these. I mean, in the book of Ephesians, it's put a little different. It says, submit to one another. And then it says, wives, submit to your husbands. So you've got the mutual. And the way it's described in Ephesians is this. The husband gives himself up for his wife. And then the comparison, oh my goodness, the comparison is with Christ giving up his life. Now that is some pretty serious giving up. Do you think that Christ submitted his life? Yes, he did. Not my will, but your will be done. There was submission going on there. Now, I'm not talking about usurping the role of the husband. I just want to highlight that this is a mutual giving up for a greater good. And when we compete and we try to win, everybody loses. And that's what happens with the scorekeeping in the competition is the whole marriage loses. And so 
I guess, you know, one of the big things I've learned in life is that, you know, when I look at a fellow believer, whether it's my spouse or someone in this congregation or any other believer, they're never the opponent. You know, we, we may come to a place, a married couple may come to a place where they are, are at an impasse and they can't reach a resolution and they've been there five and ten and fifty times before. And how do you get past it? You know what a helpful truth is? A helpful truth is that if there has been bitterness and, and, uh, and resentment and these sort of things, that that's not who my spouse is. And that's not who I am. That the power of sin may operate in any one of us, but it's not who we are. The marriage has a common enemy called sin, but your spouse is not your enemy. How many times do we find that married couples come in for counseling and they're believing the worst and assuming the worst about the other person? It's because they've identified their spouse with sin. They have accumulated the five or ten sinful actions that have occurred and said, that's who my spouse is. And when we recognize that there's a power of sin seeking to devour and there's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but that is not my spouse. That power may have operated in my spouse, but that is not my spouse. That is a big deal. And that certainly brings revelation as we recognize we're on the same team. God help us. God be our comforter. God be our counselor. God be our guide. We're on the same team. Teach us, Lord. And we get back to that us mentality that we started with. But this time, the us is infused with a third party. God Himself, Christ in you, and Christ in your spouse. You'll notice this attitude is fitting in the Lord. Remember how we talked about the new heart? This submission, it fits. It's not killing a person's personality. It's not pushing someone down. This, expressed this way, you know what it is? It's love. It's Christ loving the husband through the wife. Likewise, this is Christ loving the wife through the husband. Husbands, love your wives. Don't be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. We're going to print out this verse and make it available at the end uh, to display to your children framed in your living room and every room. Uh, no, but you see here, it's interesting that Paul, I mean, he's such a big deal. He's a traveling apostle. He's the major voice of the New Testament. And he pauses for a minute to address children. And this is read publicly in a congregation, in a home church. And you just sort of assume that maybe the kids, their ears perk up when they hear the word children. And from there, he's saying... You want to please the Lord? Well, nothing is a greater expression for you right now than to be all ears and just soak in the wisdom of your parents because they've been there before you. Now, you see, you see what's happening here. I mean, none of us live these things. How many of you as wives could read the previous verse and say, yes, I have done that in every respect? And how many of us as husbands could say, yes, I have done this in every respect? Well, none of us in this room. Likewise, children, none of us as children could say we've done this. The goal is not perfection. Don't miss it. The goal is not perfection and measuring yourself. The goal is to understand the heart of the Lord as He lives within us. This is the agenda of a loving God. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so they will not lose heart. How many of us, I can testify as a father, how many of us get to this place, it's extremely tempting to be overbearing, to be over the top. We want a parent like our parents did it. Uh, we look to some of the times that our parents blew up at us, and it's almost like it's imprinted on the brain. Have you ever noticed that, that you've got reactions imprinted on the brain, and they feel so familiar, and you grew up with them, and then when your kids do something, you think just like dad thought. And what is 
a neat opportunity, what is an awesome privilege is that the mind of Christ now offers us another way. I mean, the mind of Christ says, you know what? You're not just gray matter. You may have reacted 50 times just like dad did. But let me tell you, that's not your identity. Your identity is not dad. Your identity is in me. Your identity, for me, it would be my identity is not Farley. My identity is in Christ. Your identity is not your last name. Your identity is in Jesus. And the mind of Christ, you know, who understands the things of the Lord? But we have the mind of Christ. Fathers, it is a challenge to react differently and to wait for the second thought. We want to live by impulse. Somebody does something and we want to react by impulse. And the Spirit of God says, wait for it. You may have acted by impulse 10,000 times, but wait for it. There's another thought here. Do you hear it? It's quieter. It's softer. It's not imposing. It's not rude. It's not overbearing. But it's there. It's there. And it's Jesus. You know, I also want to just mention this. God's discipline of us is not exasperating. How many Christians feel beaten up by God? They've disappointed God. They're shamed. They feel shame about God. They feel lesser. They feel like they never went on that mission trip. They never became what that retreat said to become. They never fulfilled that prophecy when somebody put that hand on their forehead. They never fulfilled that uh, recommitment when they walked down the aisle. They never, they never, they never. And so God is just frustrated. Well, remember, you know, the Lord's discipline, the Lord's love doesn't exasperate us. He's already modeled this for us. All right, lastly, we see the workplace, and we'll finish up now. It says, slaves in all things, obey those who are your masters. This is not like Civil War type slavery. Uh, these are house servants who earned money and had a, had a roof over their head, and it wasn't abusive like we would see uh, earlier in this nation. This is something different. So people have misunderstood it as affirming slavery. That's not what it's doing. It says this, don't do external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Does that mean be scared of God? No, it means be reverent awe of, are you kidding me? The life of God dwells within me and I get to do everything in his name and represent. Whoa, this deserves reverence and awe. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. So things may be looking bleak here on earth. You may feel like you're not inheriting much. There's not a lot of fortune going on. But it says this, that we can please the Lord and know that there is an inheritance. And in fact, I love this statement. It's one of the coolest phrases in the New Testament because a lot of jokers out there have made a big deal out of rewards with an S on the end. And they have suckered us into the idea that you need to be earning a bunch of crowns. Well, the crowns are the crown of life and the crown of righteousness. And that's Jesus. You have him. So whether it's a symbolic crown or a literal crown, it's a representation of Jesus. And that's why they toss them like Frisbees. They toss those crowns right at Jesus' feet because it's about him anyway. So, you know, it's not about collecting rewards. It's not about collecting crowns. It's not about collecting jewelry. It's not about materialism in heaven. You'll notice here, what is the reward? The reward is your inheritance. Do you see that? And what does Peter say about our inheritance? He said it is undefiled, kept in heaven for us, will not fade away. Do you have Christians argued over different inheritances? No, they've argued over different rewards. The inheritance, we've always believed the inheritance is I get a new body, eternity with God, a beautiful life with Him forever. And as a child, as a son, as a daughter, I receive that status and that closeness. And man, my inheritance in Christ is incredible. But it's not one inheritance for you and another for you and another for you. Do you earn an inheritance? 
Is that what you do? Do you earn an inheritance? No, somebody dies and then you're given an inheritance, right? It's not an earning. Now notice here, the reward is the inheritance and the inheritance is the reward. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done and that without partiality. What does that mean? Is God going to swoop down? If, if you abuse illegal drugs, is God going to swoop down and cause those effects to not happen for you? If, if you go and punch your boss in the face, is God going to show up right after that and say, now please don't fire him, he's a Christian. No, consequences happen without partiality. And so this is not about eternal judgment or anything like that. We're safe, we're not judged, or our sins have been taken away. This is about earthly consequences, and they're real. So don't live life looking over your shoulder, running from the law. That is not a life to live. All right, well, we're done with our series, and I hope that the big takeaway here, whether it's a behavior passage or whether it's an attitude verse, I hope that you see something, and that is that we're simply putting on Jesus. We're putting on Jesus because Jesus has already been put in. We're putting on what's been put in. We're working out what God has worked in. And so it's an inside-out operation. And it's all about Jesus from start to finish. When you read a behavior verse, you're reading Jesus' resume. That's what you're reading, a description of him so that he can be himself in and through us. It's a life of trust, not a life of try. It's about trusting, not trying. It's about Jesus. Jesus plus nothing, 100% natural, no additives. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege of housing your life. We thank you for giving us more than church and more than a book. We thank you for giving us your life. We read chapter after chapter and we want to engage in behavior improvement and we want to make a list and we want to cross things off and we want to check boxes. Father, I pray that we might see Jesus in all. Jesus as creator, Jesus as designer, Jesus as destiny, Jesus as life, Jesus as behavior, Jesus as our good works, Jesus as our everything. Father, we thank you for your son. We honor what he's done. We honor his death and our death in him. We honor his resurrection and our new life in him. We honor Jesus. We worship the Lord Jesus Christ. He deserves all respect, Father. We thank you for what you have done in sending your Son so that we might see your face in his finished work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.